All right, and the next thing is, well, here's the, hang on a second. This is our, our uh, blog, web, our website for the Home Fellowship. And then this is the website that Michael has set up for us. And by the way, Rod, do you like that color better? Yes, I do. I can read it now. Okay. I, I... <laughs> I had it Wednesday night. I had it on, you know, the, the color it automatically defaults to, which is kind of a blue. And Rod, it was on a black background, and Rod couldn't see it. But this is the uh, uh, website that Michael set up for us. Uh, it's a joint website, uh, by the way. It's it's both the fee site at LBL uh, that Michael and, and Erica and and, and them uh, are going to have this year and then it's got another page for the hot springs website where we're going to be and then this is the facebook page where i've set up um so i can put all the different details and i think michael i send michael everything i put on there and he puts it on uh, our joint website and this is sabbath number seven that's what i was coming around to uh, we've been counting. It's also the 49th day, and uh, tomorrow will be the what I I prefer the term Feast of Weeks, but it's the day of Pentecost, which means 50th. And Mark is going to lead our Bible study tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. So I'm not going to say anything because I don't know what direction he's going with it, uh, but uh, I know we'll have good discussion. We're continuing finally, Barb, First Corinthians, I mean, First Peter chapter 5. She's, Barb said she's read it five different times because she thought we were going to cover it the next week, and we've ended up going in different directions. But uh, uh, this is the area to which this letter is addressed, uh, which I, I think is kind of interesting. It's a Gentile area. Uh, but there were Jews and Gent Gentiles there. There were Jewish Christians. There were Gentile Christians in this area. So in this final chapter, and I, and, and I know, you know, that Paul didn't, I mean, Peter didn't divide his letter into chapters. Uh, we've done that. So it's easier to read and understand and not, not to understand, but to get through. <clears throat> Peter talks of new responsibilities in this last letter uh, with, within the church. Uh, and, and he speaks of these responsibilities during times of trouble. And he exhorted the elders to be shepherds. He exhorted young men to submit to the leadership of the elders. Now, as, as uh, Arthur was, was saying a while ago, the our submission does not mean, need to be to people who lord it over top down uh i've got a word for them and i hope you all don't mind but you know some of them are a bunch of jerks and um uh, i've had two of those as pastors um and and both of them uh, one of them didn't start out as a jerk, but ended up as a jerk. And the other one, I guess he was a jerk his whole life. I know Mark knows him. Arthur probably does. But um, anyway, he told the young men to submit to the elders and for everyone to stand firm in. Oh, John likes my word, jerk. He's he's apparently known so. Um so, so uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry, let me back up. He exhorted the elders to be shepherds, young men to submit to the shepherds, and for everyone to stand firm in the faith. And Peter begins this portion of his letter with an exhortation to elders. He says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you. And we'll get into the rest of, of, of verse one in a minute. But I wanted to talk a little bit about about elders. Um, elders have been active in Israel since their time in Egypt. Uh, 
it, it, it doesn't tell us why. I mean, I did a search on elders and um, the first time it comes up as someone who is considered a leader is in Exodus 3. Now, the word elder is used earlier than that, but it only means older person. Um, this word means older person who is a leader um, or more mature leaders of the nation. And, and we see the first time that that, that it's, it's used this way in Exodus 3.16. And Moses has come back to Egypt from being out in the in the wilderness and after going up uh, on on Mount Sinai and so on. And God says to him, go and gather the elders of Israel together. Okay, so there were leaders. There were elders of Israel. Gather them together. And here's what I want you to say. Yahweh, Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and I've seen what's done to you in Egypt. And this is the first time, at least that I have, that I found where the leadership of an elder is, is, is discussed. Now in Numbers 11. I have, yeah. I have a comment. Sure. Um, so is this next one, next one going to be about elders also? Yeah. Oh, go ahead then. I'll wait. Okay. Um, in in Numbers, uh, th this is when the, the people were tired of the manna. And, and they, you know, we want meat to eat. Uh, Moses heard the people complaining, weeping, and, and each man at the doorway of his tent. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. And so Moses talks to God and says, you know, and, and I tell you what, Moses, you have to admire Moses because he talked to God just like we would talk to each other. And he said, he said to, to God, he said, why have you put me in this position? You know, these people hate me because all you're giving them to eat is is manna, and 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 they're tired of it. And in verse fourteen, he says, "Look, I I can't do this by myself." And so in verse fifteen, this is when it it it, it he really gets interesting. He said, "Look, if you're if you're not going to help me here, just just wipe me out, take me out of this. Uh, but if I've found favor in your sight, help me, please." And in verse 16 it says uh Yahweh said to Moses okay I want you to gather me 70 men from the elders of Israel so this is another example that these men were leaders of the nation he says gather these elders of Israel who you know to be elders of the people and their officers and this I don't like the way the NASB puts this I'll, I'll show you something different in just a second. Gather me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and their officers, and bring to them to the tent of the meeting. What, by the way, that tent of meeting is the word moed. That's another way that that word is used. But this is not a separation. It's not elders and officers. It's elders who are officers. And, and I've got another scripture, Mark, and I'm sorry. Uh, this is from the King James, and it's it's rare when I when I use the King James to, to give a better translation. It's usually the other way around. He said, "Gather me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers." In other words, they're in charge. They are people that the Israelites look up to. Okay, Mark, you're up. I don't know if he lost his connection or went to get him a cup of coffee. Yeah, I wonder where he went to. It was one. Sorry, I, I forgot to mute unmute myself. Uh, I do that all the time. Yeah. Right. Thank you for uh, letting me know. Um, the point 
the point I was going to make was not just about this scripture, but about the about the idea. It's not well. It's not an idea, about the point that God didn't come here uh, uh, visit the Israelites and automatically create a new culture. Um, there, the Israelites had a culture. And that culture obviously included elders. So the, another, another indication that we can see about that is when God said, this month shall be the beginning of months. He didn't say, oh, let's talk about the concept of a calendar. You know, there is a calendar and it's got seven days of the week and it's got months. Did you guys know about that? No, he used a calendar that was already in existence. And, you know, I'm not commenting about re refining of that. But the point, the point is that we often probably, I know in my past, I totally didn't realize this that the Israelites had a culture and he began to work with that culture and in that, in that culture. That's my point. Yeah. I, good point. And, and, and uh, a lot of us believe that you can go all the way back to Genesis one and, and see that the 10 commandments were in effect. Uh, and, and I agree with you hundred percent, Mark, the calendar has been around from the very beginning. You know, God God said what he, he said right off the bat in Genesis 1, 14, I've got these special days. Well, how in the world do you know there's special days if there's not a calendar? So I, I think, you know, I think you make a great point. Uh, just a comment on what Mark said, which it, it's not germane to, to the topic at large, but it really brought up a thought when he, because I'm thinking about what he says there about God using the existing culture. Um, you know, he's not introducing a new culture or establishing a, you know, something new that they didn't understand. I think this goes, I think, to a, a great length to kind of put understanding to a, um, a, a gut feeling that I've had about people that are insistent in the Sabbatarian community about the fact that the Hebrew culture was something that God established. And that therefore we need to use, you know, sacred names and all the things that have to do with the Hebrew culture. And I think that your comment, Mark, and again, this is not germane to the topic, but I think that your uh, your comment here, I think, lends itself to uh, a better understanding, at least in my mind at this moment, in terms of uh, understanding that, you know, that God worked with a culture that existed. He didn't create the culture, so we don't need to treat it as uh, sacred, per se, and make you know, the Hebrew language or, or certain things regarding to their culture, sacrosanct, uh, if, that, if that makes any sense. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. You know, if you look at it, how as long as they were in Egypt, if you think about our language and how much it has changed just since the King James Bible was written, for example, uh, the Hebrew that they spoke when they left Egypt was certainly not the same as the Hebrew that they spoke when they entered Egypt. So, you know, just reinforcing your comment on the sacred name stuff. Uh, I'd like to jump in here if I may, please, because uh, I agree with what is being said, but uh, when we think about living 400 years as uh, guests, in the first place, but eventually becoming slaves. Uh, we must realize, surely, as we've seen in our nation in many, many examples where intercultural relationships and marriages take place, I wonder just uh, as far as language is concerned, they weren't sitting over on the side in uh, the Israelite camp speaking Hebrew and not speaking or learning uh, some Egyptian language. Uh, they, they, they certainly would have been into marriage. In, in fact, in the Exodus, there were people that went out who were not Israelitish. And so they were under, in the end, under the control of the Egyptians. So this is not just a simple 
uh, statement that uh, the elders um, were positions of office. It was more of a statement, I think, as I think about this, that there's a, in families, families intermarry uh, and children and grandchildren and great grandchildren come along and the elder could be a person of age, the last one or oldest one in a family unit. And so the meaning of elders can also include that. I also think that uh, we should remember that language is very important. Um, and how God has used language uh, to teach us and, uh, and to give examples of, of things that would cause that language uh, to be changed. Um, and as Arthur said, I believe that, you know, this, there was a good reason why God did not want the Israelites to marry uh, outside of their, of the Israelite nation, because it brought in, and Solomon is the perfect example, and all of his wives, it brought in all of these other, quote unquote, cultures with all of their quote-unquote gods and uh, uh, destroyed, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Israelite, Israel as we know it. And God knew this would happen, and that's why he forbade them to do it. Yeah. Anyway, that's... Yeah. Right. I'm going to try to get you back to your point is you know, when you have a nation that grew as large as Israel, the whole concept of elders uh, within the uh, Israelite you know, population would have been a, a logical uh, uh, understanding in terms of, of the Egyptians being able to exert control over their population to get them to the point where they would were used as slave labor. And we know from the scriptures that they were provided food and pots of meat and those things. So it just it, it just goes to figure that uh, is what Skip is bringing out in the study here that you know elders as they existed when they were brought out were were, were the people that had positions of influence and authority uh, over the Israelite nation uh, while they were slaves, which would make logical sense in terms of order and carrying out orders from Pharaoh and whatnot. So, yeah. okay, Skip, you're up. Good, Point. Skip. Bar, wait a minute, Barb was going to say something. Oh. Um. I I see where the word elder and shepherd are in the first uh, couple of sentences in the, in uh, chapter five. Uh, the word shepherd, I can recall in several places uh, in the um, Hebrew scriptures where uh, God says the shepherd had a responsibility and if they misused their uh, uh the shepherding, he was not happy with them at all. He really gave them a stern warning. Uh, and this was throughout the, the uh, Hebrew scripture. Right. right. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit uh, too, Barb. I'm glad you mentioned that. Jim? Is he on mute? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, back in one of the earlier scriptures that you uh, that you uh, quoted, it said that they were elders and officers. So, in a sense, you could have been an elder, but not one that was an officer in the sense that you were really a leader. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so these were people that in some sense exercised, I don't want to, I'm going to use the word control, but I, didn't mean, I don't mean it necessarily that way. But they exercised rulership over some part of, of Israel. Yeah, any group of people, especially one with millions, you know, of, of quote members, unquote, but any group needs to have, 
a limited number of people that they look up to as decision makers, uh, leaders. Um, but as, as we're going to get into in, in this letter, it's not their job to cram everything down the people's throats. You know, um, one of the things that, that uh, was fought for, I believe by a couple of people who were on this uh, call right here back in 1995, was congregationalism within the new church that was being formed. And it was agreed initially that each congregation, as I understand it, you guys can correct me, but as I understand it, that each congregation would be independent, but they would all uh, go go together to form a little C church. And, and, and it turns out that some of the, quote, leaders, unquote, uh, what was the word I used earlier? Jerks, I believe, is the way that is. It, I think it's a very apt word. You all... You may, may not think so, but I think it works real well. Um, you know, they didn't want that. They wanted uh, a hierarchy, a top down. They wanted to be in charge. And when they were in charge, they told everybody what to do, what they could believe, what they could preach, as Arthur mentioned earlier, where a, a person who is a delegator finds people who can do a certain job better than they can. And they turn it over to them and they say, you know, report back to me. Let me know what's going on. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not bragging on myself, but I am a delegator. I believe very strongly in delegating um, a, a job to someone who obviously is better at it than I am. And one of the problems that we have in Congress today is those guys think they know everything and they can do everything. And as as, as this guy said the other day, some of you heard, heard this earlier uh, when there were just a few of us online, but the, the guy that spoke the other day said that the minute a new Congress person's plane lands in Washington, D.C., they are struck by the spirit of stupidity. And I can't think of anything that strikes more truth than, than that. But anyway, I don't want to get into, into, into politics. Sorry. But anyway, yeah, thanks. Every, I think everybody's... Uh, uh, Skip? Yeah, Jim. Well, one additional thing. Uh, I just heard it yesterday listening to an old sermon from Ron Dart about Revelation, when you look at the seven churches in Revelation, all within a day's walking distance of each other, basically, all of them have different problems. And had they been a top-down church, they all would have had the same problems. And, you know, emphasizing the independence of the congregations, basically. That's a good point. That that is a that's a that's a real good point. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um all right. Now, uh, I've got another uh scripture about elders in in the psalm, in Psalm 107. Uh let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So and and this is this is later, but uh there was an assembly of the elders. There was a group of elders. And, and I, I like what Mark said. I think this goes all the way back uh, uh, at least to Abraham. Uh, it may go all the way back to Noah. I don't, you know, I don't know. But there was a calendar. There was the law. There were elders. You know, it looks to me like it goes all the way back uh cuz like like mark said uh god didn't say all of a sudden in exodus 12 i got a new calendar for you people you know no the calendar was already there the moeds were already there they knew what those were and you know we could talk all day long about some of this stuff but 
when when Moses said, uh, "I want my people to go out into the into the wilderness and and, and have a celebration, have and worship God," there were already moeds in effect. And you know what? We know that there's Passover and the days of unleavened bread that were begun. I, woo, bad word. That were that were uh, celebrated shortly after Moses said that. Now, I don't know if he had in mind, you know, let's go out in the wilderness and celebrate the Passover or celebrate the Days of Unleavened Bread. Days of Unleavened Bread technically uh, could not have started until they were leaving Egypt with unleavened bread. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't have had the two holy days, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm digressing and I'm not on my notes. So, and you all know that's dangerous when I leave my notes. Diane has said this for years. You know, if Skip is speaking and doesn't have any notes, watch out. It could last all day long. But if he has notes, at least there will be an end. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> so anyway, so now by Jesus' day, part of the leading class, which were priests, scribes, and guess what? Elders. They were among the men who wanted him killed. In Matthew 16, from that time forth began Jesus to show to his disciples that he was going to die. And who was going to have him killed? Elders, chief priests, and scribes. They were an, an, an official, if you will, assembly uh, within the all of the hierarchy, hierarchy of, of of leaderships, and they wanted Jesus gone. They wanted him out of there. Uh, the the elders did. Now, uh, the first time I found elders to have been ordained uh, was in Acts fourteen. And this was on Paul's first missionary journey, and they were in Galatia. And you can see the first missionary journey when they when they get into Asia Minor, uh, Perga, Lystra, Iconium, Derby, and so on, Pisidian, Pisidian, Antioch. And this this is this is Galatia. And here's what it says: when they were in, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting. And this is the first time I found in the New Testament church, the church that Christ started. Well, I don't know, you know, I probably shouldn't say it that way, but you, you all know what I'm trying to say. When uh, this, this fledging uh, belief in Jesus Christ group of people. So I, I you know, I'm going to call that, you know, the, the, the New Testament church. But anyway, they ordained elders. They laid hands on. They asked God to bless. They asked God to have his Holy Spirit in, enter into these uh, men and, and some women. Uh, and this, this is when, apparently, this is when that particular practice was started. Uh, does anybody have any comments or, or, or disagreement on on that, I'm just saying this is the first time I that I saw that I've seen it that I saw it. Uh, I'd like to make one point, and sure. that is, uh, you know, there's large uh, travel wasn't easy. The the, ch the groups or organizations were uh, typically in homes. They weren't um, large groups as we would imagine today. Uh, of course, this would have been out of the world what we're doing today, but. Um, you know, they were disparate groups that the people who had open minds and listened to the, the message uh, got together in homes. And it, and it wasn't a huge organization in the way we tend to look at things today. Yeah, it was a group just like what we've got right here. Now, we're scattered and we're, we're all online. We're not in the same house, but we have a house church. And we just happen to do ours online. And we do ours online, as you all know, because 
It's for people who don't have a church to go to that they feel that they feel comfortable at. Let me put it that way. Um, I'd like to point out that this scripture um, doesn't say they commended them to the church organization that would rule and tell them everything to do. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see that in there either, Mark. Good point. <laughs> right. Uh, although the version that I've got here uh, is, uh, oh, let me find it again, says that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, praying and fasting as they entrusted them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Um, and so, you know, I, I imagine a corporate church would grab onto that and say, see, uh, the church leadership is the one that appoints leaders and not the congregations themselves. Uh, again, there's so many opportunities for human nature to wiggle their way into uh you know establishing authority and power over other people um, when jesus himself said it shall not be so among you for if you're going to be great you need to be a servant and that's something that somewhere got lost in translation in uh, corporate church culture yeah i don't have this script if, if i'd known we were going in this direction i would have put it in here no i mean you all know i'm kidding uh in antioch the people chose the seven uh, deacons or whatever you want to call it. The leadership did. The congregation did. And I, you know, if somebody wants to throw this top down stuff at me, I'm going to throw that scripture out and say, you know, well, well, they must have really been confused because that's not the way it worked. Uh, the, 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 the people themselves knew who had been doing the work. And that, that's the point. And I think everybody understands this. That before someone is ordained, they should already be doing the work. And also, you don't have to be ordained in order to do the work. You do the work. You do the job. You serve the people. And then if there's a need or a reason to ask God for special blessing on these people, then, then they're ordained. Um, you know, and that's the way I think it should work. Well, I think that's the biblical way. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to build on what Michael said too, that what, you know, because we, why is it we want to work backwards you know this relates to also what mark said about their their culture already being established is that in our defense um, of eldership as the way corporate church has determined and established today we we want to take our current version of what we think an elder should be and do and we we want to make that the standard and then we want to go back and point to these other scriptures and say see they did it back then as well as you know assuming <laughs> that that the elders that were appointed back in the time of exodus were were appointed in exactly the same way for the same purpose and with the same goal in mind that we have now. And so we're just kind of pulling up the path to justify what we're doing in the future or in the present, instead of going back and trying to understand the culture in that time. Uh, you know, so when elders were appointed in that time, we really don't have any concrete way of knowing what they did and how they operated and how much authority they wielded and how they were viewed by the people and all those things. So, you know, to try and point at that and use it to justify what we've determined we're going to have elders be and do and, and whatever, um, you know, is a serious error on our part, you know, and that's what we did in corporate um churches in the past so just my thoughts yeah and, and of course they weren't supposed to do it that way in 95 you know yeah, i'd like to uh 
Jill's comment there, um, we use the term, for example, church. It, it just is an assembly a group that got together. And once again, we're imposing on the past our present concepts. And rather than accept the fact that these were very small, disparate groups who had a similar common goal in mind as far as they understood at the time, but it wasn't a church organization. It wasn't a building. It was in people's homes. And Paul, uh, I think, makes this pretty clear with the number of people he mentioned at the end of uh, the book of Acts, there, I think, or was it the end of the Romans, are traveling all over the place and the brothers and sisters that he mentioned all over the place, that, that this was not a structured, I'm going to use the word corporate or corporation, as Jill used, and I think Mark did too. We're, we're, we're really light years away from the culture and the value systems and the, and the way of life that these we're reading now that these people lived. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's interesting to me that, that, that we, we read the scriptures, and when I say we, I'm not talking about us, <laughs> but we read the scriptures and we read about all these house churches and how all of them were independent, uh, but yet worked together and knew each other in a lot of places like, you know, uh, like Jim was talking about uh, the, the churches that uh, John uh, had a vision about. But how do we read about all these house churches and then come up with this big corporate thing? I don't know. I, I I don't know how that happened. And it's not just us. It's it's all all big churches. Yeah, somebody was going to say something. Yeah, corporate corporate churches evolved over a period of time. Uh, and I think I mentioned uh, maybe last Bible study that Ignatius, right at the end of the uh, first century, began changing it. And then the Gentile churches took over from the Jewish churches and then the, or the synagogues, and then the split took place. And then the organization in a Gentile fashion, not according to the uh, Old Testament organization, um, began to bloom and blossom and things uh, changed radically in the second century. Uh, if, if I could, I wanna try to tie what Jill said with what you said, Skip, because I think you said something very important and very vital uh, that I think we all need to keep in mind. It's something that I, I, I've had to learn myself. Uh, you know, J Jill was talking, you know, about the point that um, as far as the, the corporate church goes, I mean, we, we've we been part of a church culture where, um, you, you Skip, you said that we just need to be doing the work. And we belong to a church culture that when you did the work, the, the leadership would come down and say, who gave you authority to do the work? Yeah. We didn't give you that authority. And that's because the corporate church looked on uh, ordaining uh diaconos and ordaining elders as a political office this was an office that was to be uh you know when you were anointed to be you know a leader to do these things rather than well someone that's already been doing the work because we were involved in a corporate church that you couldn't do the work until you were ordained and i think it's really important when you to listen to what skip said because if you're doing the work you've already shown yourself by your fruits that you are capable of handling um, you know, for lack of a better word, and I hate using this word, a, a title, a position of recognized authority where hands are laid on you and you're, you're, you're acknowledged by the congregation or the group that you're, you're doing, you know, the Lord's work, you're doing this, uh, these things. And I've had to unlearn a lot of the corporate ideas because, I mean, for example, when I wrote to Skip about this this week, when I went to India for the first time in 2010, when we went to the River Canal to do our first uh, mass baptism, I remember telling Brian, I can't do this. And he looked at me and I said, I'm not ordained as an elder or a deacon. I, I can't do baptisms. And I remember Brian, and he doesn't get angry very often, getting very angry with me in front of everybody and let me have it, saying, why do you think you're here? Who do you think ordained you and perform miracles to get you here to do what you're about to do? And I had a, and that really stymied me because I was so stuck in, the corporate mindset thinking because that's what we were all trained to do with you know week after week of, of the kind of uh, you know indoctrination i guess for lack of a better word that we had in terms of respecting church leadership that uh i think what skip said is very important i think it's properly applied in conjunction with what jesus said about if you're going to be great be a servant and then it, and that is do the work you don't have to have a you know a, a corporate leadership lay hands on you to begin doing the work of evangelism or doing the work of uh, diaconos and service and helping the widows and the orphans 
you make yourself a committee of one and just do it. And uh, and the Lord is is the one that has ordained all of us to do these things when you read the scriptures. And so that's a very important point that I just wanted to kind of hammer home, Skip, because I think it was very important that you said that. Okay. Um, all right. So um, as the uh, as the church spread and grew, you know, and we can we can see what 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 was done mostly by the apostle Paul. Certainly not. He wasn't the only one. There was work being done south of Jerusalem, uh, but but Paul was was going west. Uh, he went north, and then he went he went west, and the church began to spread and began to grow. And these were house churches, or in a you know maybe they were in a building, but they were independent groups like what we've been talking about. And these leaders were appointed or ordained, whatever term you want to, to say, but you know, the, the, the people were already doing the work, but anyway, and these are men and, and, and some of the women who were uh, to lead their congregations. And this is who Peter is addressing this letter to. And the word elder comes from the Greek word presbuteris. Uh, and it basically means elderly, uh, older. In in the King James Version, it's translated several different ways, but all of them have to do with age. And I, I'm going to throw in maturity at that point. As somebody said a, a minute ago, uh, maybe, I don't remember who, but the, the oldest one in the family, I think maybe it's Arthur, but forgive me if that's not right. Um, but here, here, uh, 64 times this word presbyteris was translated elder, 64 times. Old man once, eldest once, elder woman once. And this is in the King James Version. Peter calls himself a fellow elder. You know what that word is? Sempresbuteris. And the, the S-Y-M apparently means fellow or me also or however you want to look at it. So now remember the Greek rule that any time a Y follows a vowel, it gets a new sound. That's why I'm saying it's presbuteris, even though it looks like it's presbuteris, it's presbuteris. So I, I've got some Presbyterians that I need to tell them that they're they're pronouncing their name wrong. They're Presbyterians. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Okay. Um, all right, we've been going about 50 minutes, and uh, this is what I love about this group. We're going to start in verse 1, if that's okay with you all. Uh, Di Diane asked me, she, she said, I see there's... Uh, 14 verses in this chapter, so that's, what's that, three weeks? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, th that's what I love about this group is that uh, we we certainly can can talk about lots of different things. All right, so Peter starts off here, <clears throat> and he says, I exhort exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder, you know, presbyteris and, and uh, sim presbyteris. And I'm also a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And I'm a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. In other words, Peter says, one of these days I'm going to be resurrected and changed and I'm going to be a spirit being just like Jesus Christ. And he says to them, I want you to shepherd the flock of God among you. And I want you to exercise oversight, not cram it down their throat, but exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. And not for sordid gain. Now, the King James Version says not for Filthy lucre. I'll come back to that in just a second. But with eagerness, I want you to I want you to really get after 
the job that you've been given. Not as lording it over those allotted to your charge. This is what we've been talking about here. But proving to be examples to the flock. Don't tell them every move to make. Let them look at you. Let them see how you manage your life, how God operates in your life. And so here's what Peter tells the elders. He said, I want you to shepherd the flock. I want you to lead. Don't push. You can't push sheep. Don't do it for money or other reward. Do it with eagerness or joy. Don't lord it over the people under your charge, as, as, it, as it said, and be, be a good example. The behavior of church leaders should encourage, not discourage, the flock. Now, as we all know, Jesus Christ uses the term shepherd and flock lots of different times. There's there's parables. Uh, he, he mentions it. He talks to them about this. Peter uses both terms in verse 2. Back up here in verse 2. Shepherd the flock. A flock follows the shepherd. Now, you all know me and my crazy sense of humor. Um, we, know, we know about the shepherd. We know about the flock. But what about the sheepdog? How does the sheepdog enter into this? Yeah. I knew that uh, you were going to come up with something like this, that you couldn't stay away from it. No, I can't help myself. I cannot help myself. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I, I, seriously, I, I, I actually, you know, started out joking about this earlier this morning. I got to thinking, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's us. Maybe, maybe that's our job. But anyway, um, in verse two, Peter uses the word poem, poemaio, which is translated several different ways, and I, and, and I think this is something that we. We need to understand, and, and I think most of you probably already do, but anyway, um, here it is. I, I put down several translations of the word they translated from this word poimeo, poimeo, in, in the King James. It's translated feed, in ASB, shepherd, complete Jewish, shepherd. The Revised Standard says tend, and it's talking about the flock. It's talking about you're an elder, you have a responsibility. What is it that you're supposed to do? Feed them, shepherd them, tend them, care for, down here in the New Living Translation. And then, and then the Amplified Version, which kind of, gives us a translation, you know, in, in the translation itself, says 10 and then defines that as nurture, guard, guide, and fold. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that because, you know, they, they are a fold, if you will. Now, there's more to taking care of a flock of sheep than feeding them, isn't there? And all of these different translations give us those different things. Shepherding a flock includes feeding, but it, it's a whole lot more. Tend is feeding, but it's a whole lot more. Care for is feeding, but it's more. Um, and, and so Peter's talking to these elders, and he's he's trying to cover all of all of his bases and, and the you know, by using this uh, this word. And so let's go back and let's look at what Jesus told Peter. Think about it now. This, this guy that wrote this letter, well, Peter Silas, we'll, we'll get to that at the very end, but uh, Peter writes this letter 
didn't he have some experience with Jesus Christ? Didn't Jesus teach him a little bit about feeding and shepherding? John 21, 15. Now, I've read this a thousand times, as have you all. We studied it not long ago. And you know what we do? We zero in, and it's not wrong, it's just what we do. We zero in on the word love. Simon, son of John, do you, you know, agape, or, you know, what? I'm not going into all that. Do you love me more than these? He says, yes. But today we're going to zero in the other word. Tend my lambs. The King James Version says feed. King James Version says feed all three times. But the NASB, the first time, it translates the word tend. There's actually two Greek words that are used in this. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that here in just a second. But it says, tend my lambs. And then he asks him again if he loves him. And he says, shepherd my sheep. Again, the King James says feed. And then he says it the third time. And by this time, Simon's, you know, like, I can't believe you asked me this three times. And he says, here, tend my sheep. So I, I've always zeroed in on the love word, but I think this tend word is least as important, if not more important, because he's telling him how to treat his flock. So um, I can't help but, but believe that these words that Christ gave to Peter was a big part of the reason that Peter spent part of this chapter explaining the job that elders are supposed to do. I, I'm sorry, I can't help but think this is where that came from. And, and from a hundred other conversations that that he had. Now, I'm going to give you an example. This is, y'all are going to think I'm crazy. Those of you who don't already think I'm crazy. Uh, Diane and I have next week, I mean, th uh, yeah, next week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we're going to be in Hot Springs. <clears throat> and we're going we're to work on pinning down some stuff on, on the feast. Well, Diane and I have two dogs, and they're our children. And those of you who have dogs, you know what I'm saying. I mean, we have other children, but they don't live here anymore. I mean, we have real children, but they don't live anymore. But we've got two dogs. So um, we're concerned about what's going to happen to the two dogs while we're gone for three days, because a couple of weeks ago, we we went to Hot Springs, and when we got back, the dogs were all warped and acted weird you know uh, uh so anyway here's what we here's what we've done and i think it's an example of what christ is telling peter here we have a, a lady who's going to come in every day while we're gone well it's just a couple of days but anyway and she's going to feed the dogs in the morning and in the middle of the afternoon we also are going to have one of our daughters come in at noon and at seven or eight o'clock at night and do two things. Love on the dogs and take them outside and make sure that they go to the bathroom. And I, I really think that this is an example of what Christ and, and Peter are, are talking about. We're concerned that our dogs don't just need to be fed. They need more than that. And this is what Jesus is saying, and this is what Peter is saying, or at least that's, you know, kind of the way that uh, that I see it. Okay. Um, there's more to tending a, shot of, a flock of sheep, and that's who we are. That's what we are. There's more to that shepherding them than just feeding them. Okay, anyway, anybody got any comments about my crazy analogy there? Well, a couple of things. Skip. Um, oh, sorry, you want to go ahead, Arthur? No, 
Fine, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say the uh, if you go back to the twenty third Psalm, that is the um, kind of the complete description of the shepherd, and you know he does he does a lot of things in the twenty third Psalm. You know, makes them lie down in green pastures. Well, they have to get there, so he has to choose the green pastures, know where to take them, and and make them relaxed enough that they want to lie down. He leads them by waters. He refreshes them or restores them, guides them on the right path, um, even though when they might have to go through a dark valley or something, you know, toward the green pastures, they, the shepherd is able to keep them from being afraid. Um, and the rod and the staff, instead of being used to whack the sheep, it says they comfort me, you know. Um, so maybe the rod and staff were used to to ward off uh, wolves and, and evil things and, and to direct them and keep them from falling off the cliff in the dark valley or whatever. Um, but those, you know, there's just a, a bunch of different things. And, you know, I recognize that the 23rd Psalm is written for us and our relationship with Jesus, but um, it also describes a, a more comprehensive job when it comes to um, to the shepherd. That's all. Great point. Great point. Arthur? Thank you. Yeah, it's hard for us, I think, to, um, uh, to comprehend, really. We have a lot of information around uh, the sheep analogy. And um, uh, it's a metaphor. Uh, it, it, uh, and it breaks down ultimately because no one sheep fits all, if I can put it that way. And I can't help uh, thinking about um, marshes and my travels in the Middle East and seeing the shepherd and uh, he was taking his sheep back to the fold for the night. In the front was a goat. The sheep all followed the goat. And the shepherd sat on his donkey at the back. And they knew where to go but he was there uh, as a sort of overseer, if you will, just to make sure everything was okay. So there's a limited analogy that we can pull from this, this uh, example. And as I said, I think it breaks down ultimately. There are lots of areas of being kind, being gentle, being responsible, overseeing with care and, uh, and kindness, et cetera, et cetera, which is really what the, I, I read out of this whole uh, John 21, etc., is to take loving care of one another. Absolutely. Uh, and one thing I forgot to mention, or I, I mentioned that there were two Greek words, but I didn't mention them. One of them is bosco, B-O-S-K-O, and the other is poiomano. Uh, bosco means to feed or keep. Um, and and I, I can't remember... Those two words are are used in in these in these examples here that uh, I have from the NASB, uh, and I'm sorry I forgot to write down which is which. But anyway, Bosco means to feed or keep. Poyameno means to act as a shepherd, which is more than feeding and keeping, as we uh, mentioned, as Jill uh, perfectly mentioned the 23rd Psalm. A shepherd doesn't just feed his sheep. He tends them. He guides, he guards, he feeds, he cares for, oversees and watches diligently as, as Jill was going through the 23rd Psalm, all of the different things that that a shepherd does. And 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 yes, it, it, it you know, technically it may be talking about one thing, but it also applies to how a leader should act toward the people that look up to that leader. So anyway, uh I wanted to I wanted to add add that. Now in verse you, yeah, yes can I just touch back on Please. on your um comments about John twenty one. Um I thought that was interesting that you said, you know, because like probably all of us that every time that scripture had been brought up and discussed, the emphasis was on the way Peter loved 
Jesus as opposed to the action that was supposed to uh, arise out of that love. And, you know, we, I remember always knowing that, you know, the first was, um, the, you know, the, there were the three kinds of love, the, uh, the something and the filios and the, the, you know, the brotherly love and the um, uh, marriage kind of love and then the love for God. Um, but that made me think that, that there's also, an, you know, what you said made me think that's so interesting because in some ways what he's saying is it doesn't matter how well you know a person. There may be some people that are just acquaintances or, you know, that you have brotherly love for. They live in your neighborhood. You kind of see them at picnics and whatever. And then there's your spouse who, or your children who you love with that different, that stronger kind of love. And, and then there's that reverence for God, that godly love. But in some ways, he's saying it doesn't matter what your relationship is with the different individuals. You should treat, you should, just like Arthur said, you should treat them all the same, whether they're just, you know, acquaintances or brotherly love people um, or whether they're your family or whether it's, it's God. They all are worthy of that shepherd-like care and that love and tending. And so that, you know, I just added a dimension to my thinking. And I'm, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, and as many times as I've read this, I've never, ever, ever focused in on Jesus' words about tending the sheep and shepherd them and, and so on. I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, that it hit, I don't know if I read it or if it hit me or what, but there it is. And I think it makes a lot more sense now to me. Um, well, yes, because always before it was almost as though the first two levels of love, there was an inadequacy attached to them somehow, that it just wasn't enough, you know, in the, in the way we dissected that in the past, it was, it was almost a negative thing that was attached to the first two responses that Peter had, that it's like, it's not enough, it's just not enough. You know, and and really, I don't think, like you said, I don't think that really is the message of that section. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, OK, so now in in verse four, uh, Peter throws in a, a comment about. The resurrection. Um, when When the chief shepherd now. You know, when when I first read that, and we, you know, you all tell me what your opinions are. He's the chief shepherd. Are we? Are we shepherds also, um, or are we the sheep, or are are we both? I mean, I I, <clears throat> I presume if someone leads a congregation or leads a group of people or whatever. I presume they're a, a shepherd, but in in our group, we're I guess we're all shepherds and we're all sheep because we lead each other. We I mean everybody has an equal part. Uh, I, you know I, I may be butchering all of that, but anyway, when when Christ appears, you and who is you? You is who Peter was writing to. It's the shepherds, but it's also the sheep. So when when Christ appears, when he returns, we will receive the unfading crown of, of glory. And this includes women in leadership roles too. Uh, I know, you know, the churches, all churches have battled that one for a long time. And and I, I'm I'm just I'm glad that I recognize men and women as equals. Uh, and and so but anyway, I don't want to get into that. Sorry, but there's an interesting thing here that I'm I'm going to show you. 
Um, it says you will receive the unfading crown of glory. All right, the word, the Greek word that was translated unfading is amarantinos, amarantinos. And it means to not fade away. Well, okay, we'll be immortal and so on. But one of the things that I found in, in my preparation was something I think is really interesting. There is a flower that's named the amaranth. And it's very slow to fade. And it revives if moistened with water. So the concept of this, I mean, the, the, the name for this flower is that it became a symbol of immortality because it would fade away and it's just, it's, it's dead, you know, oh my goodness. And then the rain came and up it pops again. And it, oh, can I add to that? Sure, Skip? please, yeah. If you've ever planted them in your garden, that red thing is a mass of seeds. What? At the end of the season, those seeds drop. You will never be without those again if you plant them in your garden. Interesting. Interesting. So you certainly see it, the, the concept of it being unfading, don't you? So anyway, that, I had never seen that before. So obviously, you do you, I mean, what do you do with them? Do you eat them? Do they uh, just look pretty or what? Uh, largely they just look pretty i'm sure they're actually the way these the picture you've got of them in a row in uh it almost looks like they're deliberately grown it could be that could be a flower garden to where they're growing them for floral arrangements but um um somebody just gave me some one one year and they were just they spread everywhere there and um you know so i just knew how prevalent the seeds can be but i'm sure there is a use for them i just have not looked that up or used them for anything myself well amanda just posted that they are edible so um there you are they are edible okay um next peter addresses young men younger men and he fair paraphrases psalm 334 According to uh, the commentaries, but I think a, a much better paraphrase would be Psalm 138.6, and I'm going to show both of them. Uh, and it shows how God feels about pride and humility. Now, in, in, here's verse 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. Now, again, uh, it can be used in savory dishes as well as sweet bread, porridge. I missed all of that, but uh, it's in the it's in the the, the chats. Thanks. Um, he he he. You know I I don't know whether to use the word quote or paraphrase. Generally, it's a paraphrase, and here it it is a paraphrase. He says that you younger men listen to your elders, listen to the <clears throat> the ones that aren't cramming it down your throat, the ones that are shepherds that are leading you correctly. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility. We're, we're going to talk about that Greek word here in just a second. Toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here's Proverbs 3.34 and Psalm 138.6. Um, Though he scoffed at the scoffers, I presume that's the uh, the, the, the proud, Yet he gives grace to the afflicted. I, you know, I, I suppose that's what the scholars are thinking of in these commentaries. I don't, I just don't get it connected. But Psalm 138, 6 says, For though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly, okay? That's the, the humble. But the haughty, that's the proud, he knows from afar. So I, I think 138.6 is, is a better paraphrase of this scripture that says he's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, so he he tells the younger men to clothe themselves 
with humility. The Greek for clothe refers to the apron being a badge of servitude. Okay, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to serve others? And the Greek is inkamboamahi. Sorry, it means to gird, to engirdle oneself for labor. And it, it figuratively means the apron that's a badge of servitude that we should wear or should be clothed in. And he says that Christians are to imitate Jesus. Well, I'm saying this. Christians are to imitate Jesus Christ who girded himself and served the brethren. And this is Michael Deering says this about every third sentence that we are to wash feet. We're to serve others. <clears throat> Jesus Christ got up from supper. He laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And this is not the same Greek word, by the way. Uh, not that it matters, but he wrapped himself with the towel. He showed himself ready for servitude. He was ready to wash feet. He poured water in the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. He served them, and he wiped their feet with the towel with which he was girded. And like I say, that's not the same Greek word that Peter used, but it shows the same attitude of hum humbleness and servitude. And we are to clothe ourselves with this attitude of humbleness. And then he, he, Peter goes on in, in verse six and he says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, I wonder if we could say the opposite, that if you don't humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that maybe he won't exalt you in due time. It, it, it sounds like we're to put other people first. Now, I'm, I'm gonna mention Diane again. She loves it when I do this. She often tells the dogs and me, it's not all about you. Now, the dogs don't listen. They don't care. It is all about them. But sometimes it works for me when she says, Skip, it's not all about you. But it is truly about the dogs. So anyway, that's the second dog thing uh, that I've mentioned today. Pride makes a person self-sufficient. Now, Rod, over the years, Rod and I've talked about this. Pride is a is a is a big thing. Uh, to, I mean, he's he's the one that really made me understand uh, how dangerous pride is. Now, he's talked about it for forty years. So, pride makes a person self-sufficient, or at least makes them think they are self-sufficient. I don't need anybody. I got me. Humility, on the other hand, is a recognition of our dependence on God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time. If we are truly dependent on God, we can do what God says in verse 7. And this is tough, folks, and I'm speaking personally here. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. How easy is it for you to quit worrying about something and turning it over to God? We do that and we or we try to do that, but boy, it's tough because it just keeps coming back and nagging me something that I'm concerned about, something I'm worried about. The feast this year has been, uh, has, has, has fit that category. I, I just, have, I kept worrying and worrying and worrying. And, and finally, I don't know, I think it was week before last. 
you know, I, I, a couple of things happened and I, I finally went, thank you, God. You, you have taken this uh, weight off my shoulder because I can see now how it's going to work out. Uh, but, but it's difficult to quit worrying about things and put our worries on Christ. And yet that's what he tells us to do. But, you know, if we are able to do that, doesn't that improve our, our lives? Doesn't it improve our attitude and, you know, and, and everything? And, and then in verse 8, Michael, uh, rise up, judge the earth, pay back to the proud what they deserve. Yeah. Answering the question you asked earlier about uh, does, does God, you know, if he lifts up and exalts the humble, what does he do to the proud? So that scripture came to mind. I just oh, can't find it. Good. Thanks. Yeah. So in, in, in verse eight, he, he begins talking about be of sober spirit. Um, that means it literally means don't get drunk. But it means to be by, I'm sorry, I got the hiccups. By extension, it means be self-controlled. Be aware of what's going on around you. Be in control. Depend on God. And and yeah, technically the word means don't get drunk, but we're not supposed to get drunk, are we? It's okay to drink a little, but don't get drunk. And then he goes on and, and he talks about the devil. He says, look, if, if you're drunk, if you're not in control, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same thing's happening to other Christians. The same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Misery loves company. I don't think that's what this is saying. He's saying you're not alone. Hey, Skip. Yeah. Can we go back to verse 8? Yes, sir. Have we passed verse eight? Verse oh, it's eight. There. It's right there. Okay. Um, where it says, "Be on alert." Um, what version is this? Probably NASB. You want me to pull something else up? No, I was just going to look here. Um, because the English Standard Version says, "Be watchful." Okay. Um, let's see. Give grace of that. Oh, verse eight. Be sober, be vigilant. No, verse. Um, be vigilant. So I, the English Standard Version says be watchful. And the, uh, there's a reference in my uh, re my scripture thing that I'm looking at that goes back to Matthew 24, 42, which is, therefore stay awake for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Um, the, the point I was going to make is that a lot of us have been taught that we needed to watch world news diligently and have you know if you go back a long time ago there were people who said oh you need to have you need to have a subscription of time u.s news world report you need to be paying attention to the to the news because this is going to give us an indication prophetically of when christ is coming huh. and Therefore, um, there was the idea is all we have to do is is watch, you know, watch, 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 what, watch what, watch world news because it's going to tell us when Christ is is coming. We need to be alert, be awake, be aware of what of what is going on. Um, I learned a long time ago that this whole concept was not what the scripture was talking about it was talking about being awake and being 
alert to what was going on in your life, pay attention, as we've already covered a lot in this, in this Bible study, to pay attention about how we were living life. Not that we were witnesses to point about some impending doom that was coming on the world, but that we should be paying attention to how we are living. And if we, if there, there was some prophetic thing that happened, um, most, most likely it was there to remind us that this is not God's world, that we need to be living and doing as, as Christ did. Just like you pointed out, he watched, he was humble and he washed people's feet and that we should live as a servant with an apron around us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to, to bring this up that when it says to be alert, be vigilant, so on and so forth, it's not talking about watching out for prophecy. It's talking about the fact that we should be watching out and be aware of how we are living. This is part of self-examination and how we can be a better example and serve better, just like we read there in John, you know, you read about the, the, the points about loving. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. To be a shepherd, to be so on and so forth. Let's don't, let's, so let's not pass it by and just say we have to be casual observers of what's going on. No, we have to be doers of the word. Well, I also think, I mean, you've got to look at the whole verse because it, what it's really also pointing out is not only looking at the way you, the, uh, the way you live, but it's, it's warning you that evil is present because it goes on immediately and says, be you know be of sober spirit and and the old english word for sober and it's still a sec you know another um definition in the dictionary it's not always a reference to drinking it's it's uh, a sensible and calm and and considered way of thinking um so when they say sober as a judge it doesn't really mean that he had didn't have he wasn't drinking the night before it, it means that he ponders and seriously considers uh, the judgment that he's going to make. So, you know, that's the kind of sober spirit that we're being told. And being on the alert, then it says your adversary, the devil, is goes around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And if you've watched any of the uh, National Geographic videos, you know that the lion doesn't um, go around the, the jungle roaring at his enemies. He sneaks along through the grass um, and sneaks up on on unwitting and and un inattentive prey. Um, he may be known for his roaring, and he may roar after he's taken down the animal. But um, his principal modus operandi is to creep around like a cat, a big cat and sneak up on you and get you when you're not watching. So, you know, I think this is a, a serious warning that, you know, um, that not only it, that part of your watching how you live and behaving and, and, and paying attention to how you live is being well aware of the fact that we have an ever present source of evil that, it, you know, is, is watching us to see if, if we leave open an opportunity um, to be consumed by the roaring lion. So that's my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, Since Mark brought it up, um, to expand on, on his point about our past culture basically teaching us to be, you know, read Time Magazine, see, and I mean, I remember all those sermons that we need to be watchful, but it was specifically pointed that we need to be watchful of world events that would tick off all the prophetic boxes that the church laid out. This is what's gonna happen. You know, the, the Pope in Germany and all this stuff. So we're supposed to watch world events in order to uh, justify the, the, the prophetic doctrines that the church taught. And while we were busy doing that, we were not paying any attention to take Jill's point 
of the lion that was creeping into uh, the church in terms of our secular culture. We were so busy looking at prophetic issues and what was going to be the, the sign that Christ's return was imminent. We weren't looking over the fact that our churches were falling victim to the cultural secularism that has consumed our entire country to the point that we're in a rapid state of decline off the cliff, which, you know, uh, belays or it, it upholds Jill's point about this roaring lion. If you're only looking at danger from one direction and it only can be applied in a certain specific way, you're not looking for danger coming from the other directions that's always looking to uh, take you down from the sides or behind. We're to be vigilant of all the dangers that surround us because we're, we're in the business of saving lives, not just physical lives, spiritual lives. That's the whole reason we're to preach the gospel. If we're gonna be silent and keep to ourselves and only talk about prophetic things, how are we going to be able to save someone that's walking towards eternal death saying, no, that this is wrong. This is the way I walk in it. And we can't do that if we're hung up on watching world events, waiting for Christ to come back. So, you know, it's all part of sitting on the fence, which is kind of what uh, I was taught. I'm glad that uh, that I'm coming out of that understanding and we have a job to do. It's saving a people, a population, the world population who's marching straight forward off the cliff into eternal death. And our job in preaching the gospel is to wake them up, plant the seed, try to get them to turn around and do a 180 because they're all walking to eternal death. And our job is to save them. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a couple of things that, that I'm I've zeroed in on lately is one uh, is the our, our ministry to bring others to God, and you can argue all day long about well, yeah, well, God has to call him and all. Well, yeah, but you know, Jesus Christ Himself said, you know, there's a big harvest out there, and we need people to help with it, you know, and that's us, and we need to bring people to to God, you know, uh, give them a little. But the the other part of that's what we covered. Uh, I don't know, last week or week before last, is we have a ministry of reconciliation. And our church has forgotten all about that because we don't care whether we reconcile with somebody or not. What we care about is being right. I have to be right. I have to not only be right, but I have to convince you that I'm right. That's not what a ministry of reconciliation is. You know, I mean, just common sense tells you you're supposed to, to reconcile with people. Don't argue, don't fuss, don't fight. It's our job to bring people to Christ without causing them to leave or whatever. And I know many of us, I know Michael and I, we've talked about this a hundred times, you know, we're recovering Pharisees and we we did it the wrong way for so long. And uh, now hopefully, you know, hopefully we're doing it right. Uh, but we need to uh, bring people to Christ and we need to reconcile with our brethren, uh, whether whether it's somebody that believes the same way we do or not. As long as they believe in Jesus Christ, they're our brethren. Somebody was going to say something. I uh, I just wanted to comment on something that Jill said because I, I think it's very profound, and that is that uh, the devil is watching us to see you know if if there's any way he can get at us, and sometimes I think we forget that that the devil is actually watching us for a way that he can devour us. Uh, anyway, she said it better than that, but uh, I thought I thought that was uh, something that we should actually think about, that the devil is watching us. That's right. Anyway. You know, whatever it was these people were watching at that time was not reading U.S. News and World Report or any of that other stuff, they didn't have it. You know, that they could not watch world events like we do 
and so that watching has to refer to their personal lives. Now they had the Jerusalem news, Jim. Uh, that, yeah, but Heretz wasn't being published then. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, those are, those are really good points. Those are, are really good points. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about this devil guy, this being here. Um, Diablos is, is the Greek for devil, and it means false accuser or slanderer. And, you know, you all have been talking about how he slips around and he sneaks up. Jill was mentioning that. He is a false accuser. He's a slanderer. Now, by this time, th these Christians were well aware of what was going on in Rome in the Colosseum. And Christians were being put to death by lions. Nero fed Christians to the lions. Nero uh, uh, would would pour oil on people and and hang them to a stake and and light them up so that they could light his parties and light the city. Um, you know the anyway I, ugh, I just so they were very well aware of. Uh, both sides of this issue, one that he's prowling around like a roaring lion, that would be Nero, but at the same time, sneaking up on you like what Jill was talking about. And, he, and he's saying, don't let your guard down. He says, Satan, our adversary, also known as the slanderer, you know, we, we see this in his conversation with God about Job. Satan answered uh, Yahweh and, and said, yeah, Job's sure. Job's obeying you. He's a good guy. Well, who wouldn't be? Look at all the blessings that you've given him. You've, you've put a hedge around him, around his house, and, and you know, he doesn't have anything to worry about. You've blessed the work of his hands and all that. But I'm telling you, God, if, if you take away that fence, he will curse you to your face. And he's, he's slandering Job, Job in, in effect. And I don't know if that works perfectly, but I, I know you all all understand that. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night. Yeah, I didn't see who put that up there, but yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so now in in verse nine going going back not not here in job but verse nine of chapter five it says all christians are suffering but then in verse 10 we're told that we will receive eternal glory in christ who will rule forever but the god of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory by jesus christ after you have suffered a while, he'll make you perfect. He will establish you. He will strengthen you. He will settle you. We know what we have to look forward to. And no, it's not here today. It's coming. And then verse 11, talking about, I'm not sure this is talking about the father or, or, or the son or both. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In the next verse, well, I, I put an in-between verse. In verse 12, let me just jump over here. By Silvanus, a faithful brother to you, as I suppose, I've written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. And I, I'm not sure Peter is saying I wrote all of this, and so so Silas is who this is. Silas wrote a little bit of it, or Silas wrote most of it, and I wrote just a little bit. It doesn't matter, but the two of them wrote 
what we've been reading. And I want to talk a, a, just a hair about Silas. This is in Antioch, and it was after uh, Paul and Barnabas got into it about Mark. And so Paul needed someone else to go with him, so he chose Silas. And then he left, and here's what we were talking about earlier being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. That, that, I, you know, uh, when Luke wrote this, he did not understand because he should have put being recommended by the hierarchy under the grace of God. Sorry for the sarcasm, but notice it says being recommended by the brethren. Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? Anyway, okay. So, uh, Silas is a faithful brother and, 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 and so on. Now, Silas has been with Paul for about 10 years at this point. And, uh, he, he knows pretty well. He knows Peter pretty well. Silas also has been with Paul. I'm I'm not sure how they, you know, they they work together, but they obviously uh did. Now, the next verse is kind of interesting. And scholars go in three different directions at least with this scripture. She who is in Babylon. Now, most people think that he's talking about the church or a house church or a group of house churches or whatever. Some scholars think it's talking about Peter's wife. Uh, sorry, I don't, I, don't, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. But anyway, she who is in Babylon was chosen together with you. With who? With the people that Peter's writing this to. Sends you greetings and so does my son in the faith. Mark, yeah, this is the same Mark, the guy that wrote the gospel, the guy that uh, left Paul and that that Paul and Barnabas got into about. So there are three ways that most scholars look at this scripture, where Babylon is. One, Babylon in Egypt. There's this a, a town near Egypt, near Cairo, in Egypt. Two, ancient Babylon, where Israel was taken captive. That would be, uh, uh, you know, Babylon and Egypt would be southwest. Ancient Babylon would be southeast. And then the third one, and the one that most scholars agree with, is that he's talking about Rome. You know, uh, we know in, in Revelation, it's our understanding that um, uh, you know, the, the, the woman that's seen there in the hills and all of that's talking about Rome. So most scholars agree that Rome is the most likely, uh, as it, 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 it said that Peter was in Rome at this time. Now we don't know that hundred percent, but there's a lot of evidence that Peter was in Rome at this time and not long from here now, he would be martyred. And it's interesting also to note that Peter speaks of his, quote, son, Mark, in verse 13. And, and like I say, it's most likely the Mark, the writer of the gospel. And then the last verse in this chapter says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Apparently. A kiss was a way that they greeted each other back then, and it and it it went on for a while, and then it became less used, if you will. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's not something that we should do today. I don't think. Uh, so it it was a a custom of saying hello and goodbye at this particular 
time. And that's it. That's what I've got, folks. That was 14 verses. Just one thing about kissing. Yeah. Uh, we tend to think of kissing on the lips, but it's very common for people who show affection by putting cheek to cheek and making sound uh, to one another. And I think probably that would be the more appropriate way to view that. Uh, that yes, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Yeah, as Erica said, that it, it's still a custom in in in, a, in different parts of the world. You know, in, even in Greece today, uh, they greet each other with a cheek to cheek kiss. Um, uh, so in some places, it's you know just that's just part of the custom of the culture. That's in some place, in some places, it's rude not to. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Skip. Yes, Barb. Uh, I might to go back to the uh, verse. I can't see. My eyes are bad. Uh, verse thirteen, where it said, "She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Second John, in the very first verse, is kind of similar where it says to the chosen lady her children whom i love in the truth and not i only but also all who knows the truth and et cetera et cetera and so anyway uh, in second john it said the chosen lady yeah uh which is similar to what uh, peter's saying here so i i believe it's a church yeah, I do too. I do too. Um, all right. Um, not trying to cut this off, just going to make a point. Don't forget, this is the seventh Sabbath. And on the morrow after the seventh Sabbath is the Feast of Weeks or the day of Pentecost, which is tomorrow. And so we will have services at the regular time. I'll send the link out at. Uh, uh, uh 10 30 ish something like that and then uh i'll turn the service over to uh to mark and i i uh i, I know we'll we'll uh we'll get some good stuff out of what mark has to say and i presume we'll have another two-hour discussion <laughs> tomorrow that's no, one don't, don't forget to record it <clears throat> because some of us won't be here tomorrow because oh, we'll that's right yeah yeah brethren in west tennessee yeah. Uh, John and Carol and Eric and I are heading out that way for tomorrow. So do record it so I can listen to it later. So I know it'll be good. I don't want to miss when Mark speaks. I always learn something. Yeah. And, and uh, everybody remind me to record. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's right. You know what? Since I won't have the, I won't be doing the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint. Mark, if you don't mind, why don't you put that in your first slide to remind me or just remind me. I mean, you don't have to put it in the slide, I don't guess, but. I have it someplace. I hope I remember. <laughs> yeah. I have to put it in my PowerPoint and on my notes. I've got, I've got it on my note uh, and I've also got it in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, I have two prayer requests, by the way. Uh, again, I'm not trying to shut this down, but I do have two prayer requests. Give me a second to pull up the website and I can type it up as you're talking. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Give me a second. I'm pulling up the website here now. Let's see prayer requests. I have to edit. For some reason, WordPress takes its time whenever I hit the edit button. I don't know why that is. It still hasn't come up yet. Don't know what's up with this. That's okay. You're giving me time to drink some water. Yeah, there we go. It finally came up. I don't know why it took so long. Was today the fifteenth? Okay, okay. Nina. Uh, okay. You ready? Nina sent me a prayer request this morning. Her friend, Kellen Ayersman, A-I-R-S-M-A-N. Wait, so do that again, say that again, Skip. 
Helen Ayersman, A-I-R-S-M-A-N, uh, has, okay. can has cancer. And uh, she's the sister of, of one of Nina's real good friends. She lives in Nashville. We need to remember her in our prayers. And uh, Rod told us this morning that his daughter's house burned down last night. We don't know how much, uh, you know, whether it burned. We, we don't at this point, but but maybe by tomorrow we'll know. Rod, why don't, why don't you give us a report on this tomorrow? Okay. Are they not hurt, are they? No. No, Betsy was there, and uh, neither one of them got hurt. Okay, that's good. All right. And I want to thank Mark for correcting my misunderstanding. Well, I understood exactly what the guy said, but that the Gideons do not, you know, have that requirement that you have to believe in a ever burning hellfire. Because I've actually thought about joining the Gideons because I, I think they do good work, but I've, I've got to, you know, do some more checking. But anyway. All right. Anybody else? This has been a good one. And and no, Diane, I, it, it wasn't three parts. <laughs> she she asked me today. She she said, "Well, I see it's fourteen verses, so I guess that's going to be three parts." Or she made the comment. <laughs> and uh, it always just depends on on how much the conversation ends up dominating the study as to how many parts we end up having yeah i thought for a few minutes that we were in for a three-parter because uh we we talked about elders for a, about an hour i guess before <laughs> uh be before we got into uh, verse one but that's that's what i like about this group you know michael has made a point of saying that uh we have spoiled him uh this yes. group um and uh, also, I guess, the feast that we had at LBL. Uh, because, it, I mean, this is such a great group. I mean, I, I, don't, really, I don't know any other way to put it. Uh, we're comfortable enough that we don't have to adhere to such strict guidelines. We're all mature enough that we can go in the direction the Spirit kind of takes us in our discussion. And, uh, God willing, that'll work itself out at the feast at LBL this year because it's going to kind of sort of maybe be the Bible Home Fellowship version of the feast out there. If we can see if we can take this format and get it to work in in person, that would be great. If it if it does, um, don't know because then again the group may be very different. But we're looking forward to that possibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. Here. I'm looking forward to a small intimate feast as well. Yeah, we need we need to pray for. Uh, uh, for for that uh, because they're you know they're putting all of it together right now uh, and also prayers for what we're doing in hot springs uh, and and other feasts i mean you know I, I know people may be saying skip this is may the 15th well no it's not this is september the 15th because we got the feast coming up in a couple of weeks and got a lot of work to do <laughs> you know that's the that's the way we look at it uh, you know, and those of you who have planned feasts know exactly what we're talking about. So, uh, you know, we're usually through with all feast plans. We have everyone in place. They they know what they're going to do. They know where. They basically they they may not know who exactly is coming, but you know, uh, everything's everything's done by the first part of March. And here it is, May, and we're not through yet. So I, I know Erica and Michael and uh, whoever else is, is helping them is uh, uh, also pulling pulling hair out, pulling hair out. Well, that's oh, no, actually, no, no hair pulling out yet. We haven't gotten that. I hopefully won't have any of that. Good. But you know, but you know, we we've been behind the eight ball because a lot of the other uh, feast sites from other groups and. Like CFN, I mean, they 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 got things going because usually um, in days past, usually in Skip, you can purpose not Pentecost is usually the launch point for the day after Pentecost. Everyone starts looking and booking for where they're going to keep the the, the feast of tabernacles. Yeah. So most 
B sites have everything established and set up and marketed and maybe they'll tweak the speaking schedule every so often, but by the most part, much of their uh, um, uh, agenda and, and uh, much of their itinerary is already being published and set up and their marketing's already been done. And we're, we're still kind of in the uh, uh, planning stages in a lot of what uh, is happening in Hot Springs and in Kentucky because we're uh, kind of, we, we've moved to new locations and we're having to kind of start over from scratch in a way. And um, so uh, do keep us in prayer for that because it's, I wanted to call the feast at an LBL the fly by the seat of our pants feast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, well, you know, but I like the fact, that's why I keep saying we're going to be very uh, uh, flexible, I think is the word I end up using, because then we may have to be. It just depends on who shows up and what we're doing. Most of Bernard's congregation is going to be there, so we, we're going to have a lot of praise and worship music, and uh, uh, Skip's going to have... Um, uh a lot of uh traditional hymns over in, in the hot springs um you guys aren't having a band there are you no at the club well at, now i guess i can answer that two ways not at church but we're gonna have uh one night where the uh, vapors lounge is gonna have a a, a group come in and and do a, a oh that's gonna be great yeah yeah yeah. Well, that's going to be awesome for you guys. And and I also heard through the grapevine, my wife being the, the vine, um, I guess uh, Priscilla is going to be heading your way. So you, you'll you probably have some kind of a choir set up out there. So that'll be great for everybody there. Uh, I think that she's uh, coming your way. Oh, okay. Well, Erica, no. you're wrong. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> she, I, got a, I got an email from her and mm -hmm. said, uh, Hot Springs is a no-go for me. Now, I don't know where she's oh. going, but but you all need to con you all need to contact her and, and see. Yeah, let, I, I was hoping I thought she'd be out there. And you have a it looks like based on web traffic, Skip, uh, because we're getting a lot of hits, obviously from CGI and CEM, that uh, there's a lot of interest in hot springs. Most of the hits to the website are for hot springs. Good. Well, I'm not not good for that, but. Yeah. Um, Diane and I are going, uh, yep. wait a minute, I may not take her with me, though, come to think of it. There's an axe throwing uh, place down there, and I want to go throw an axe, but I don't think I'll take Diane with me. Oh, you don't want to put her at the target so she can you know, see her faith in you and trust in you? I, I was more thinking that I would be the target, Erica. <laughs> uh, now that you mentioned Priscilla, uh, I she could use prayers because they found the issue with her heart. Um, she may have to have a procedure done like I did a couple of years ago, opening up a artery or something. I don't know exactly what it is. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, Skip. Yeah, Jim. Have you ever watched that British comedy like Rumple of the Bailey or at the Bailey about this old British uh, barrister? No. Nope. Well, you need to because he always refers to his wife like you refer to Diane. She who must be obeyed. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. I know all about that. But you were talking about axe throwing? I, I would pay great money if somebody could get a picture of Skip with his hands tied behind his back in a tree and an apple either on top of his head with Diane getting ready to pitch an ax there. To, don't worry, honey. Sit still. Have faith. Trust in me. Yeah. Uh, that'd be a great meme to throw everywhere. Yeah, I, I'm not planning on uh, taking that chance. You don't trust your wife? Well, I trust her. I just wouldn't trust her with an axe. Oh, yeah. See, that's that's a wise man speaking. Most husbands don't trust their wives with sharp objects. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, all right. Uh, anybody else? All right. Let's remember the, the, the prayer request. We got three, Priscilla and uh, Nina's friend and uh, certainly Julie and... and uh, her house, and uh, that's got to be a, a real disaster. So, all right, um, that's it. I'm going to shut her down. Anybody else got anything?
Everyone have a great Pentecost tomorrow. Enjoy yeah. your holy day. Yep. Yep. Y'all too. Be careful on the road. Good thing you Thanks, don't have Scott. to go through Memphis. <laughs> All right. Bye.